So just a little chapter called Culinary Math. You gotta say it louder. Oh. There you go. There's one positive one in the bunch. What's that? That's a good one to copy from right there, right? So what we're gonna do is instead of taking culinary math as a whole chunk, we're gonna take it off in little sections. So we're just gonna start with just some very, very basic measurements today. Uh, I've labeled it culinary math deconstructed because what we're doing is taking each little chunk together, coming together for an overall final project. What that overall final project is gonna look like is taking a menu. From that menu, taking all the recipes, from all the recipes, getting all of the ingredients and all of the measurements. From that, you'll be given a series of invoices. From those invoices, you'll have to find your ingredients, and from those invoices, cost out to the smallest amount. So if we're purchasing by the gallon, you'll have to break it all the way down to the ounce and get the overall cost of that. By the time you're done, you should be able to figure out your menu costs from that. But we have to take that in small sections. Here's what's, um, being in this industry now 29 years, I find it very interesting that it's still very common to guess. Like, I have a restaurant now, I'm just guessing on how much to charge. Or in the family style restaurants that are corporately owned, they already have this menu mixed down. But it's still very common for people just to buy product and put what they think is a good price on it. And in fact, I had a student go through the new menu and actually take all the ingredients and do that whole project that I just told you. And then part of the project was contact Jason and ask Jason out of how many of his clients go on and actually figure out down to the ounce, down to the penny of their food costs for every single thing as it goes out the door, including the oil in the pan that's used to cook it. He said about 1% of his clients, 1%. In this industry, we're in the highest industry that has the largest failure rate. We run very, very tight numbers to make a profit. You'll run into a lot of taxes, a lot of employee costs, a lot of food costs, electrical, gas, etc. a lot of fixed costs. And so because we have to run such a tight margin, it's imperative that you know what your numbers are. And it's really unique to me to find out that people still are not doing food costing. And what's really mind blowing is they don't know how. And so in doing this lecture, what I thought is, you know, let's just look at math and just take it off in small bits instead of going, okay, we're going to do this one big assignment and then either people get it or they don't. I'm not committed to that. I'm committed that you get it because this is how you make money in our industry to buy more toys, right? And you know that's what I'm about is to, to make the money to buy the toys. So as we get into this, I know that as soon as I mention we're going to do culinary math, I get some different responses, usually uh, because I just said the M word, right? Not to be confused with the mouse word, which is another word we don't use in the kitchen, but the, the math word. For some people, here's where you're gonna be at. For some people, you're gonna go, we're gonna do math. I suck at math, I hate math, I'm not good at math, I'm a failure, right? Just be there, it's okay. For others, you're like, sweet, I can do this, no problem, I'm in like, I already do quantum physics, and I'm in like calculus 79, and like you're just out there in math. That's great. So this is going to be a breeze for you. But also consider that there's people in the middle there that are not sure. Now I'm taking this off in chunks because as I see menu costing, it's done in chunks, and it's imperative to learn each chunk. Here's the other thing. I'm going to change up some words. And the same thing kind of happened to me in math is when we went into algebra. They like took all the numbers and converted them to letters, right? Here all the time I was like doing great with numbers and then it's like, okay, doing so good with numbers, let's just put letters in instead. A plus B equals, well, duh, C, because I learned that in kindergarten, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so I had it down. They go, well, no, that's not it. What do you mean it's not it? It's gotta be it. And so, you know, I started struggling in that. And what I found is that I just didn't have an application for it. And so, allow me to insert some new words into your math vocabulary, like teaspoons, tablespoons, cups, ounces, pounds, quarts, 
and so it's just some new vocabulary in there too. So even if you're really good at math, and all of a sudden we start doing this, you go, I don't get it. I guarantee that you stick with this unit, everyone will have a light bulb going, going, I got this, I got it. And you'll start like converting the ounces of an elephant to teaspoons. Like how many ounces are in the blood of an elephant? I don't know. But that's the kind of thing where it starts getting exciting. We start figuring things out. So with that, let's do a little new vocabulary first. We'll start with the easy stuff. It's easy to spell, okay? Everyone got the spelling of that one? No. I like when you spell a word with one letter, right? Less chance to screw it up. This T, this small T, notice they put a hook on the end of it. The reason I put a hook on the end of it is because when I take notes and do my notations, I want to make sure that I correctly put down the right T. This can make a difference. Why? Because this T happens to represent teaspoon. So if it's a little T, it's a teaspoon. If it's a large T, is a tablespoon. Now, we're talking about measurement devices. We are not talking about what's in the front of the house. So if I say grab a teaspoon, you really have to look at what the application is that's going on right then. So if it looks like I'm putting creamer in a coffee and I ask to grab a teaspoon, probably don't need to bring measurement. It would probably be the teaspoon from the front of the house. So teaspoon, tablespoon. Next one we're going to work with is one fourth cup. Cup is denoted by the letter C. Next one we'll work with is one cup. Followed by one PT or pint. One QT, this stands for quart. And one G, G standing for gallon. Now there's also one other symbol we're gonna work with, especially when we get into measurement. So that's gonna be this symbol. All right, it looks like the tic-tac-toe symbol. So this symbol can be used in two ways depending on where we find the number. So if it's like this, this means number one, one right? Especially if there's an arrow like this pointing down. <laughs> so that means number one. If the number is to the left, one pound. Okay, so this symbol can be for a number. So if the actual number is on the right-hand side of that, then it becomes number one. If the number is on the left-hand side, it's pound. There's been many times people have come up and asked, what's a two number? Or a, no, that's two pounds. So you wanna make sure you have that correct. So let's look at these. This little guy here, it's a teaspoon. <laughs> kind of easy to know because it's little. So the next one up, tablespoon. tablespoon, larger. Next one, one quarter cup. There's no quarters in it, but it's still a quarter of a cup. Why well, is it a quarter of a cup? Because it's for these two. One of these being called a cup. After a cup, we have a pint. And after a pint, we have a quart. And after a quart, we have one gallon. Okay, great. So we got that down. Now, here's what I want to take. Today, we're going to talk about liquid measurement and conversion. So first, let's define what a liquid is. What is a liquid? 
We don't have to have the scientific definition, just give me some examples of liquid. Water. What else? Oil. Eggs. Cow juice. What? Cream. What else? What about flour? No. No. Flour, no. Cocoa. No. Salt. No. Tea. Oh, iced tea. Without the ice cubes? Yeah. That's liquid. What else? Beans. Ice cream. Oh. Cold <laughs> All right. So those are liquid. And some of those were dry. Here's the important part. This is where this whole thing can go sideways if you don't get this. Liquid is liquid. Dry is dry. There's a few things in there that have some weight variables. Thick molasses, honey, corn syrup. Probably want to weigh those out unless you're small amount you probably get away with. The reason you want to be careful is a lot of recipes or formulas call for weight numbers. So all of a sudden we go through this unit and you learn that two cups or one pint is equal to a pound. And your recipe calls for a pound of flour and all of a sudden you grab this and measure out two cups of flour and you go, there's a pound of flour. No, it's not. It isn't because it's, it's not a liquid. You cannot weigh anything that's a dry ingredient by using a liquid measure. If it calls for a quarter ounce of salt, you have to put it on a scale. If it calls for 10 pounds of bread flour, you got to put it on a scale. If it calls for two cups of flour, you can use two cups. But if it says a pound, you got to weigh it. So you can never use these for your dry weight measure. Got it? So with that being said, let's look at...